Um, for those of you who know, don't know me, I'm, my name's Michael Beerman. I'm one of the uh, tax barristers on our Greens list. Um, we're pleased to have you in this morning early for a, a stamp duty topic. Um, I'm rather pleased at the turnout, although it is a, an important topic. Um, uh, as times get economically more difficult, the government, like uh, the rest of the general community, struggles, struggles for money. And one of the responses we've seen as we've gone through recessions over the years is uh, the legislation under the guise of anti-avoidance and uh, trying to prevent taxpayers doing things that they shouldn't, um, they tr expand the tax base. Uh, so as late as 2002, 2004, there are High Court cases describing the stamp duty as a, as a tax on documents. Uh, and I think you'll see this morning um, that it's not. It's a transaction tax that, that affects uh, all taxpayers and shoots home in particular to solicitors at the cutting edge of uh, transaction work because of the obligations it places on them. We have two speakers this morning. Um, Dr Bill Oro, um, who, when I asked him how I should describe him and did he just want me to read out his CV, he said, no, just tell everybody that he's the the uh, greatest tax barrister that's ever existed. And I said, uh, Bill, I would love to do that, but there's, there's two problems. Uh, firstly, it's not true. <laughs> uh, and secondly, of course, um, the reason it's not true is I'm in the room. Um, the, uh, uh, Bill has been next to me in chambers pretty much since he came to the bar in 2003. He was senior academic for, for many years, um, has a wealth of experience. Um, PhD in anti-avoidance. I've read the book, don't. Um, uh, but I do commend you to him as a man who knows what he's talking about. And uh, he'll give a bit of an introduction of the landholder duty and with a special focus on uh, the issues that, that, that face practitioners, um, the more difficult ones. Bill Arrow. Thank you. Good morning. Humility does not come to barristers naturally. Um, I once was in court with Michael Bierman. We both looked at each other and said, let's switch off our phones. I did, but he thought he did. What he actually did, he put the volume to the maximum, and it went off. Need I say any more? Um, I'll be talking about certain aspects of the land rituals. What I'll do, Philip is going to focus on the core content of it, you know, what's irrelevant in transaction and some of the other issues that has been um, uh, dealt with in the recent amendments. What I'll do is I'll deal with the areas that I believe present risks for practitioners. These are areas that I have seen some practitioners strip in. Uh, I have been involved in a number of negligence claims against law firms and accounting firms involving land rich duties. And these are the areas that I believe you should be fully cognizant of, certainly in running a tax practice of any kind, including one that deals uh, with stamp duty. Land rituals, unfortunately, is an area that's not very well known because people generally assume that unless you have a direct dealing with land, be, be it by way of transfer or creation of an interest in land, there is no uh, stamp duty. Land rich is exactly the, um, a set of provisions that deal with Dealings with inland indirectly, that is through entities that hold land, trusts, and companies. Um, it used to be that the distinction between the land rich and transfer duty was, was quite clear, but nowadays there's a degree of overlap because they have amended the transfer duty, duty to extend to instances where there's a change in underlying beneficial ownership. And as you know, where there are dealings in units, for example, in a unit trust, that might, in an appropriate case, and depending on the terms of the trust deed, might precipitate a change in the underlying ownership. We'll leave all those aside. Um, land rich rules, uh, as you know, are contained in Chapter 3. They apply um, in circumstances where there are dealings that affect an entity which is described as a, a landholder. What I want to do is identify uh, the kinds of lands or interests in land that a landholder might hold that you guys need to be aware of when you're dealing with this. Um, subsection 2 of, sec uh, of Section 71 
It says, for the purposes of this part, a landholder may hold land in accordance with 72, 73, sorry, 74, 75, and 76. And these are the provisions I want to take you to. 72 deals with ordinary land holdings. And this is what Philip is going to talk about, the notion of land, what constitutes land, what is comprehended within that particular notion. Land, as you know, being lawyers, is not restricted to physical kinds of interests, but in extends, of course, to um, non-physical interests or indirect interests in land. Um, what's important to bear in mind is that a land-rich entity may include an entity that has no land holding that in the way we know it. And it extends to interests in, in, in land that arise by reason and in consequence of being a party to a contract that has not been completed. If that entity is a party to an incompleted contract, both, according to Section 74, the vendor and the purchaser will be treated as being separately entitled to the whole land. So you might look at a company and say, well, it doesn't own any land, but it might be a party to a contract. So it's important to bear that in mind. Or it might hold an option, um, but whether it's a vendor or, se or seller, it depends. So whether it's a vendor or purchaser, it depends whether the option is a put or call option. That's one instance. The second instance where you may have risk is where you deal with an entity that only holds shares in another entity. And you think, well, that's the extent of it. There's no land holding. You need to investigate whether or not those shares are shares in a company or a trust, or if it's its units in a trust, that itself holds land. And it might be indirectly, so you might own shares in a company, which in turn owns shares in, a, in another company, which in turn owns units in a unit trust, which in turn owns land. You have to trace right through it. And these are what's called constructive ownership provisions. What they do is they permit or require tracing through those particular entities and they facilitate the look through those entities to determine what your notional interest in the underlying land, referable to the proportions you hold in the various entities. So you must trace right through it. It requires you to do what's called a notional winding up. You don't have to wind it up, but if you notionally wind it up, you ask yourself, would that entity be entitled to 20% or more of the land in the underlying entity? If the answer is yes, then those linked entities must be taken into account in determining whether what you're dealing with is a land-rich um, entity. The area of greatest difficulty, you see, with land holdings, interests in contract, you can deal with that. You ask, have you entered into a contract? Um, Holding shares in another company, again, it should form a part of the assets of the company. It should be in the balance sheet. In other words, you should be able to determine these. Your biggest problem is where the company or unit trust uh, are themselves beneficiaries or objects of a power of appointment of a discretionary trust, and the discretionary trust holds land. You never know that. You may never know that. The difficulty with that is this. 76 says, a person or member of a class of person whose favor by the terms of a discretionary trust, capital, the subject of the trust may be applied, either in the exercise of a power, like the exercise of power of appointment or advancement in the context of capital, or if it's not exercised, that's default interest, those that, that, ho those that hold a default entitlement. So in circumstances where the trustee fails to exercise a power, they obtain an interest in default. Those persons are defined to mean beneficiaries for the purposes of the legislation. As you know, an object, an object of a power of appointment is technically not a beneficiary. They have an interest in the proper administration of a trust. Some judges have described it as an interest, but it's an inchoate kind of interest. It's not an interest of that of a beneficiary, even though we may describe them as such. But what the legislation does, it describes them and defines them as a beneficiary. And it says, a beneficiary of a discretionary trust is taken to own or to otherwise be entitled to the land the subject of the trust, except to the extent determined by the commission. So one, you have to know whether or not the entity you're dealing with has a, is an object of a power of appointment in some trust that you probably 
don't know about, and the probability is that the client does not know about either. Because the definition of classes of beneficiaries often are so extensive within families that they might catch each other's entities without the others being uh, aware of it. So you wouldn't know about it, the client may not know about it, and yet you need to take that into consideration. Um, I'm not sure whether words to the effect I am instructed that the company is not a beneficiary is adequate because most clients would have no idea what you're talking about. So if you ask them, is so-and-so a beneficiary, they'll say no, but they have no idea what they've answered. So you need to conduct some preliminary inquiry to be satisfied yourself um, whether, of course, uh, that is the case. If it is a beneficiary, then within the terms of the legislation, that's an object of a power appointment I'm talking about, not a beneficiary in a fixed trust then you need to ask the commissioner to make a determination whether and the extent to which it may be entitled to the land. That becomes a difficult exercise. If that entity has been entitled to distributions over a number of years, then that would present some difficulty. Um, if that entity is entitled um, to capital, uh, for example, in default at vesting, that would present some difficulty. If that entity is entitled to capital distributions prior to vesting in specified circumstances, that would present some difficulties. So these are matters that you need to take into account. But if that entity has never received anything from the trust, and the trust has been going for a number of years so that you have a pattern of distributions, then I would have thought in that particular instance, you have less to worry about. The new amendments have introduced a new concept, which is the concept of economic entitlement. Philip will take you through it in some detail. But you would see the notion of economic entitlement is such that it presents, or certainly brings within the, the duty net, a very large um, number of property development projects. A lot of the JVs I've given advice on, well, they describe them as JVs. The vast majority are actually partnerships for income tax law purposes, but leave that aside. Um, a large number of, I'll use the word arrangements, designed to uh, ensure that property can be developed without there being a disposal or creation of an interest of any kind, so as to tra attract duty, would now uh, be in jeopardy. They'll be caught, and Philip will take you through some of those. So. Any questions you have, leave it to him. It is his problem, not mine. Um, acquisition of control, I don't want to talk about it, but this has been around for some time. If you acquire control of a land-rich entity, it doesn't mean that you have to actually acquire control by way of shareholding. Control is any sort of entitlements that enables you to manage or control the way it distributes, manages its accounts, makes decisions, and so on. That's control. And that's treated as an acquisition of 100%, believe it or not. A lot of people aren't aware of that provision. Um, I gave advice very recently about an arrangement where everyone went through life narrowly thinking that none of the rules applied except that one. And that was what the provision that um, I thought the party should have taken into account. There are a number of exemptions. There are fairly the standard exemptions that you would be familiar with. In other words, if something wouldn't have been taxable as a transfer duty, under the transfer duty provisions, it wouldn't be taxable under the land rituals. But there is one new one. There used to be an exception which we described as the just and reasonable exception. In other words, if the commissioner thought it's just and reasonable, no duty, say fine. I've had a number of instances where we asked the commissioner to form the view that it's just and reasonable that no duty would be charged. And I don't think, I think they were quite bemused by the request, but anyway, they said no. I've never had a single instance where they said yes, never. But maybe I only deal with hard cases. So they've abolished that because they thought, hang on, this is too hard. What they did, they introduced a new concept, the anomalous duty provision or exemption. So now what it says, in circumstances where the commissioner is satisfied that the application of this part results in an anomalous duty outcome, and the duty payable is greater than the duty that would be payable under the transfer provisions, even then, even if the commissioner is satisfied, 
says the commissioner may reduce the duty payable. He doesn't have to. He may reduce the payable. I mean, of course, if there are appropriate circumstances for the commissioner to be satisfied, and the commissioner says, I'm satisfied, but I'm not going to exercise that discretion, then you could probably query the exercise of discretion in that particular instance, because non-exercise is a form of exercise, right? Refusing to exercise. Uh, but anyway, what is an anomalous uh, outcome or duty outcome? That, of course, would be the subject of uh, some dispute, some possibly uh, expression of views by the, um, by the State Revenue Office. Um, There is something about this anomalous duty outcome exemption. It does not apply to instances where um, it says does not apply to that is where the acquisition of an economic entitlement under Section 81 is concerned. It doesn't apply to that, and it does not apply to instances where there is an acquisition of control. So where those two provisions apply, that's 81 and 82, economic entitlement and control, you can't say well the outcome is anomalous. And you can understand why, because these are the provisions where you probably will say to the commissioner, hang on, it shouldn't operate that way. Uh, that's the most common thing. Like, for example, in the context of control, uh, where the controller or the appointor of a trust that controls a, a land rich entity dies and someone else takes over, technically there is a change in control. You might say, well, Parliament could not have contemplated the legislation to operate that way, but nevertheless, they're saying you can't say to the commissioner that's an anomalous outcome. It doesn't apply. So th this exemption applies in general, but not to instances where there is a change in control. Of course, there is an exemption that deals with uh, situations where um, a party obtains finance, you know, transfers of interests as part of a financial arrangement, but it says that it has to be solely for that purpose solely, not the dominant reason, but solely for that purpose. Um, very briefly, um, the anti-avoidance rule, again, is something that I noticed a number of people tend to ignore. It's one of the broadest general anti-avoidance rule ever written by mankind. And I have looked, by the way, at instances overseas, Canada, South Africa, Ireland, United Kingdom, New Zealand, Australia and so on. This is one of the widest ever written. It applies in circumstances where, but for a tax avoidance scheme, uh, you would have had to pay a higher duty. And as you know, as lawyers, but for has been described as an anathema to human reason. Um, the EM says that the purpose of this set of provisions is to deter artificial and contrived schemes. That's incidentally why, what, the then Treasurer John Howard said part four would apply to. It applies to artificial and contrived schemes. I view this argument so many times. Judges always ignore it. They don't respond to it. You say, well, this is not an artificial and contrived scheme. What does artificial and contrived mean anyway? No one knows. Um, I mean, if you look at dictionary definitions, whenever something uh, contrived is noble, does that mean if you come up with a new idea, you're caught? Artificial. Some people say, well, something lo loses its artificiality where it occurs consistently over a period of time. It becomes common. So artificial and contrived is a, an interesting concept. You may find a, a um, Victorian court might latch on to that, but we don't know. Um, what is a tax avoidance scheme? A tax avoidance scheme is one, it says, where its purpose or effect is to achieve a particular outcome, to reduce tax, basically, purpose or effect. In income tax legislation, only one provision uses that, well, not one, predominantly one, speaks of purpose or effect, and that's the dividend stripping rules 177E. It talks about purpose or effect. Um, I ran the argument in one of the cases that went to special leave, which was refused, that these notions should be used Whilst they are disjunctive, the word purpose should be infused into effect because it couldn't be looking to the effect only, otherwise purpose becomes entirely redundant. Uh, the full court ignored this argument and just found on other grounds. So maybe one day we'll explore that concept. But 
One thing you need to note is that um, the threshold is very low. It's not a dominant purpose like part 4a. It's a purpose. A, one of its purposes, provided it's not merely incidental. So it's an extremely low threshold before you're caught by these anti-avoidance rules. And the word scheme is so broad that it captures just about anything you do. Anything that is oral in writing, express, implied, enforceable, not enforceable, plan, proposal, action, course of action, it's all caught. Very important provision. If that provision applies, the commissioner is given the power to deem all the essential elements of the land rich duty rules to apply. So then you might say, well, these elements are missing. He actually filled the gaps by deeming them to exist. And then say, well, as far as I'm concerned, that's the entity that I'll assess, and that's the entity that will be liable to duty. Now, as an advisor, you need to be cog cognizant of Section 89, capital O. It says it applies to a person who is employed or concerned in the preparation of an instrument in relation to the acquisition of an interest in a landholder, the provision of advice in relation to that particular acquisition, or the conduct of the acquisition of an interest in a landholder. It says the person must not omit from or fail to include in the instrument or any material presented to the commissioner any fact or circumstance. So when you look at subsection 2, it's not just talking about the estate agent who participates in this, because clearly they aren't interested in the conduct of the acquisition, because they are not there to present an instrument to the SRO. It is people who are concerned in those things, but then they, it says they may not, must not omit. It assumes that they are required to do something, and the thing that they have to do is to present an instrument to the State Revenue Office. And predominantly, the people concerned here would be accountants and lawyers, I would have thought. So um, these are the people that need to be mindful of that. When it comes to state revenue office, all revenue authorities across the globe, they are more powerful than the military. Give them everything they want. Um, it is safer that way. Bear in mind, they have the powers to get them. Subject to legal professional privilege, they can get all these documents. They actually can get more documents than what you have. Very often in cases I run against the tax office, documents we do not have and we cannot get, we ask them for it because they can get them by serving notices on third parties. And those third parties would give that particular information. So give them all that information. It's better to err on the, on the side of caution. Subject to privilege, I would go um, more on the side of disclosure rather than non-disclosure. There are a number of transitional rules. I'll just draw your attention to two of them, and then I'll pass it on to Philip. Um, an acquisition by a person before 1 July 2009 of an interest, private unit trust scheme and such like, before 1 July 2009 must not be aggregated with an acquisition on or after 1 July 2012. So it keeps them separate. When it comes to economic entitlements, an acquisition by a person before 1 July 2012 of an economic entitlement must not be aggregated under 8181 with an acquisition on or after 1 July 2012. So the cutoff line is 1 July 2012. It's all acquisitions post that period. So if you already have a joint venture arrangement that is in place, and is about to proceed, it will not be caught by these provisions. It only applies to ones entered into after that. That's the extent of it. We'll take questions afterwards.